Welcome to the Peacebuilding Practitioner, a resource page and podcast for people working on conflict, on peacebuilding and on social justice issues. My name is Bjorn Eser and I'm the founder of and shaker and maker behind the Peacebuilding Practitioner. And today you are listening to the seventh episode of season two of the Peacebuilding Practitioners podcast, Today's episode engages with two of the main questions in the media world. Who is it we are reporting for and how much do they need to know? Big questions, I know, so let me not waste any time and instead hand over to Antonia without further delay. Hello, fellows. Welcome to another episode of our conflict-sensitive journalism podcast, Up to this point, we focused on practical and technical elements that distinguish conflict-sensitive journalism from traditional conflict reporting. In this episode now, I will look at those elements that represent principles behind those tools. All tools are no use as long as journalists don't review the fundamental assumptions that drive our reporting. So let's look at the next set of principles through this lens and go back to some very basic questions. For whom do we make news? And what do they really need to know? I know, it's a hell lot of stuff to go through. Conflict-sensitive journalism is a pretty big subject matter. But hey, that's what we're here for, right? So let's crack on. Principle number nine. Do we report for passive, stupid audiences? Or are our readers actually active, smart users of journalism? How journalists see their readers and audiences defines how they see their role as journalists and guides their choice of reporting. Many journalists, and especially media management, tend to see their readers and audiences as passive recipients at the end of the news production chain. This perspective is rooted in the idea that journalism is a business. It justifies an entertainment-focused reporting style, since this is cheaper and faster to produce, and requires less investment in terms of financial and human resources. The significantly higher investment required to produce high-quality information – think of the cost associated with maintaining a network of reporters around the globe – seems not justifiable under such a perspective, since the information is not used by the passive reader but just consumed. While indeed a lot of readers consume news like entertainment, this of course is a view that fails to acknowledge the critical importance of factual and accurate information to enable democratic processes in society, and also just simple day-to-day decision-making. Journalists who adhere to conflict-sensitive journalism principles see their readers as active members of society who use the information provided by the media to make relevant decisions for their own lives. The readers don't only have the right to information, they also have a significant information need – And journalists are the ones responding to this need by providing the necessary access to high-quality, impartial and truth-oriented information. Fake news are not just a glitch in the system, they are a fundamental violation of people's rights to information. Principle 10. Empowerment or disempowerment. The Human Rights Catalogue integrates the right to information as well as the right to free expression into the list of human rights. Both, the right to information as well as the right to free expression, require independent non-biased journalism to provide it a channel and a platform. Journalism is defined as a function in democratic society, which aims to inform and educate the people about relevant issues in society so they can participate in political processes. That means informing and educating can only be successfully done if journalists are independent and reports allow the readers to fully understand the issues of concern. Only full comprehension of problems and their causes and effects allows the reader to develop an opinion and make well-informed choices. When we look at conspiracy theories, then you realize how far away often information flow is when it is not run through a very professional journalism filter. Information found on the internet provided via social media platforms that does not adhere to this leads to a whole lot of confusion, strange conclusions and decision-making and, as a consequence, rather strange actions 
too often media reports present conflict stories without contextualizing events. And the reader is left with a puzzle with missing pieces. We talked about that in our last episode. Consequently, the reader is not fully able to comprehend the situation and becomes receptive to the manipulation of propagandists who provide simple, understandable messages that are often wrong but serve their interests. The more confusing and daunting and headache-inducing the situation is, the more we all long for a simple, clear explanation. But, in reality, the more headache-inducing a situation is, the more complex tends to be the solution, if there is any at all. Traditionally, the focus of reporting lies primarily on elite sources and newsmakers. Also this we discussed in our last episode. This, combined with a lack of context, suggests to the reader that he or she is not able to comprehend, to make sense of what is happening, and therefore has to leave it to the leaders to handle the problem. This is very much in the interest of some leaders, that people think, oh, they're the only ones who can handle the big decisions, they're the only ones who understand what is going on, because that means leaders maintain power. That means the people are non-critical, they defer their own decision-making power to their leaders. Finally, there's another element to consider. Reports that do not provide explanations for direct violence leave the reader with the perception that dangerous and insane individuals are trying to destroy peace and security for insane reasons. Violence is seen as mad and therefore manageable only by the use of counter-violence. A task for the military, with civilians being limited to passive observers. So now this contradicts all the ideas about civilian peace movements, civil society movements, peace initiatives and so, and so forth. But it is a view that is heavily propagated in the media, just by focusing so much on the superficial interpretation of violence and on military as the key response. All of this leaves the readers with a feeling of helplessness and the impression that they have no role in the situation except from being spectators, waiting in fear, hoping to be rescued by the great leaders. This kind of reporting is disempowering and, as said earlier, makes the people receptive to propaganda messages and manipulation. High-quality journalism allows the reader to gain deeper understanding of conflict situations, their root causes and the roles, needs and motivations of all actors involved in the situation. Understanding conflict and its root causes, being able to identify structural and cultural violence as fundament for direct violence, allows the reader to assess a variety of possible solutions and responses to the conflict. Such reports integrate not only elite perspectives, but also people's perspectives, which signals to the reader that not only political and military leaders have the capacities to engage and influence the situation. Understanding of the situation and the awareness of the involvement of non-elite actors empowers the people and builds the confidence to engage, for example, to keep elite actors accountable for their actions instead of surrendering to their decision-making. It further encourages the reader to take an active position into shaping reality according to their own needs and desires. Principle 11. Propaganda. And how journalism either feeds or fights the manipulation of public opinion. A direct consequence of the availability or lack of availability of independent information and the presentation of conflict in the news media is the degree to which people are receptive to propaganda. The aim of propaganda is to influence people's decision-making by creating or suppressing a specific opinion. Therefore, propaganda directly contradicts good journalism, which aims to allow people to make their own choices based on factual information. Journalists have to avoid being used for propaganda, regardless whether propaganda serves a good purpose for example, peace advocacy, or a negative one, for example, war propaganda. In a two-party geometry, there is no neutral position, also not for the journalist. Being forced to take sides, journalists tend to uncover propaganda of the other side, but overlook propaganda on their side. Focusing on direct violence, blame and the simplification of complex conflicts make journalists prone to swallowing debate provided by propagandists.
Framing a conflict as a roundtable allows also the journalist to have an independent, unique position in which the journalist, and ultimately the reader, becomes much more resilient to propaganda. From this point of view, the journalist can identify all actors' concerns and all actors' propaganda. Exploring a conflict's complexity, underlying issues and structural and cultural violence build deeper understanding and help reporters to identify propaganda messages and avoid the bait provided by propagandists. When we talk about propaganda, we also have to talk about the just war principles. And that leads us to our principle number 12, just war versus the cost of war. When conflicts escalate, propaganda efforts are at their peak, often aiming to prepare people to engage in war. News are the battleground of public opinion. When conflict is presented as an exchange of direct violence between two parties, of which one is good and one is demonized as evil, and therefore to be blamed, we see the creation of a so-called war narrative. This reasoning becomes the justification for conflict management through force, in extreme cases, war, which is presented as the only means available to defeat the evil other. When a democratic government chooses to go to war, it can't just do this on its own account. To go to war, democracies have to convince their citizens, their people, that this war is somewhat justified. Propaganda here utilizes and feeds media reports to create this justification for war based on the so-called just war theory that has been coined by a number of philosophers, in particular the Christian philosopher Thomas Aquinas. So what is this just war theory? The just war theory is based on the assumption that under certain conditions going to war could be justified. These conditions are that there is a just cause, that the war declaring party has competent authority, is authorized to declare war against another, that it does this with so-called right intentions, the aim to create peace by the means of war, for example, that there is a probability of success, that war is the last resort and all other means have been exhausted, and that the means applied are proportionate to the evil that they prevent. Conflict-sensitive journalism does not simply accept the just war narrative. Instead of discussing why war might be justified, journalists need to focus on the cost of war. They reveal the true face of war by showing its impact on all stakeholders. This includes the perspectives of combatants as well as non-combatants. Elite perspectives and sources such as generals and politicians are considered as valuable as the perspectives of other sectors such as business, health, education and the voices of the people. When reporting war, journalists try to account the cost of war in terms of monetary expenses, human lives, the destruction to physical and social structure and the long-term effects of war on the population. Showing the cost of war does not mean presenting a sterile set of numbers as body count. Good reporting aims to allow the reader to understand conflict. When conflict has escalated into war, it is the task of journalists to make the reader aware of the who, what, where, when, how and why of this war, providing a truthful and unbeautified picture. While propagandists attempt to show only those aspects of war which serve their party's interests, Journalists have to show the cost of war so that people can decide if that cost is truly worth paying and if they therefore choose to support or reject war as a means to handle conflict. Finding justifications for war is always a slippery slope and it usually involves trying to find someone to blame, someone whose fault it is, someone who propagandists can stir and direct our anger against. Looking at conflicts through the lens of blame hides a simple fact, that conflict is never one-sided. And solving conflicts is always a shared challenge. And this is our conflict-sensitive journalism principle number 13. Whenever journalists become trapped within a propagandistic perspective, their reporting becomes filled with blame. The question that leads articles and investigations is, whose fault is it? 
The question of blame is often emphasized in reporting through choice of two-party geometry and event-based reporting, with a focus on direct violence. As a result, one party is demonized. Which party depends on hidden biases of the reporter? Such reporting fuels negative emotions between stakeholders and veils the central truth that conflict is always a shared challenge. Instead of searching for someone to blame with the consequences of endless mutual accusations, conflict-sensitive journalism proposes a different set of lead questions while reporting conflict and violence. Those lead questions are what is really happening and why is it happening? How does the conflict affect all groups and individuals involved? What do the stakeholders really want? We talked about this in a previous principle. And how can all actors' interests be addressed? Our reports need to explore the underlying problems, the stakeholders' interests and the effect the conflict has on all parties involved. Identifying the structural and cultural violence as triggers or root causes of direct violence allows us to distinguish between the problem and the parties involved and prevents the demonizing of individuals and conflict parties. Event-focused reports which emphasize direct violence do not provide explanations for why violence happens. Especially when a conflict is framed as two-party geometry, the reader is urged to blame one side. Exploring the root causes of conflict by analyzing its context allows the reader to understand that conflict is a shared problem of all stakeholders. It takes us out of the two-party geometry, out of a competitive mindset and allows us to see the situation as a joint problem, a joint puzzle to solve. Does that mean we as journalists should provide what we could call a cotton ball journalism, a soft kind of journalism, one that doesn't ask too critical questions, one that isn't provocative? Just the opposite. Our principle number 14 says journalism should be provocative, but against the right villain. When conflict-sensitive journalism raises the concern of reporters centering their stories around blame, journalists tend to become very defensive. They dismiss conflict-sensitive journalism as a soft, toothless approach, as, as I said, throwing cotton balls, and claim that journalism needs to be provocative to create change. I agree that a soft, non-confrontational approach to reporting, as often promoted by peace journalism trainers, is inappropriate for the journalistic profession and inadequate when it comes to tackling social injustice or violence. Journalism needs to be provocative, but in a constructive way. Journalists who try to be provocative often direct blame towards individuals and their actions. The result might be, at best, the removal of certain individuals from roles of influence, but more often it leads to hardened resistance, libel cases and in conflict-ridden environments not seldom to the death of the journalist. Conflict-sensitive journalism provides an alternative approach. It provokes by criticizing the system that enables misconduct not focusing primarily on blaming individuals. It points out problems, explores structural violence and underlying conditions. Let's explore this further by using an example. In Indonesia, a lot of cases have been brought up against government officials for corruption. Once a government official has been seen to be corrupt or proven to be corrupt, this person tends to be removed from office. What changes? Well, not much changes, it is very likely that the next person taking over the job ends up being similarly corrupt. How comes? Because corruption is not necessarily an individual's failure, it is enabled by an entire system. This becomes very clear when we look at the case of illegal logging. In a country like Indonesia, and in many other countries around the world, illegal logging is not an act committed by an individual or a small group or a greedy company. It involves entire systems within the state. It involves government officials turning a blind eye. It involves law enforcement turning a blind eye as well. It involves people who actually do commit the logging. It involves people who transport the logs. It involves entire systems and infrastructures and logistics to relabel the logs that have been cut illegally and make them appear legal. 
All of this involves public sources, private sources, individuals. It is fueled by poverty, it is fueled by greed. Overall, this system is not created by an individual, and therefore removing an individual wouldn't change the system. The place becomes free, someone else takes the place and slots right back in, and the entire process continues. Blaming an individual for the fault of the system is counterproductive. It doesn't change anything. What needs to be addressed, what needs to be revealed, is the entire system, the infrastructure, the processes that allow the situation to be maintained. Journalism can be very provocative, but where this provocation is only directed against individuals, it can lead to one-sidedness and biases and an oversimplification. When raising questions and questioning established systems that are dysfunctional, Provocation can be educational and constructive and challenge authorities to address systemic problems, which has much wider impact than the removal of an individual scapegoat, however misbehaved that individual might have been. The discussion very much reflects the argument around non-violent social action. While refusing to use violence to pursue their goals, non-violent activists are neither soft nor toothless, and their actions can have powerful impact if they can provoke the desired response. With which we arrive at our principle number 15. And this principle is concerned all with language. Language is the conduit of communication and a word shapes the thought. So since we're talking about propaganda and provocation in journalism, we need to take a look at the language journalists use. There's a lot to explore when it comes to the traps and faults of language, a task that exceeds what I can cover in this story here, in this episode. Hence, I'll just give you a few examples. Amongst conflict journalists, there is a tendency to use language that is shaped by the conflict parties, their justifications and hurts, and is therefore loaded with stereotypes, generalizations and labeling. When trapped in a mindset of two-party geometry, journalists tend to label groups according to the us and them scheme. For example, calling them a terrorist or a freedom fighter, thereby showing how they position themselves on one or the other side of the two-party geometry they see in a conflict. I give you an example. American journalists frequently use terms such as our guys in commentary and reports on the US troops in Iraq, which shows how strong us and them thinking had become ingrained in their reading of the situation. Furthermore, language used in conflict reports is often generalizing and unspecific, leaving endless room for biased interpretation or non-factual conclusions. Conflict-sensitive journalists try to find neutral terms, or where this is difficult, and it very often is, they use the terms groups use to describe themselves, with a specific explanation. So for example, a group which calls itself God's Army would be described as a group that calls itself God's Army. They aim to be very specific, avoiding as much as possible misinterpretation of the content of reporting. Language poses a major challenge for journalists, not just because of its complexity. It dynamically evolves with a conflict and therefore needs to be adapted and reflected upon continuously. For example, the term black was once acceptable to be used for an African American, but it is today seen as problematic. Another great example is the use of words in the media to describe the construction of a wall or a fence between Jerusalem and the West Bank. The choice of title for this infrastructure clearly showed you the leaning of the journalist's outlet, the media outlet, that was reporting on it. The spectrum was pretty broad. It went from a security fence to calling it an apartheid wall. In both cases, you see clearly the political statement entailed in the choice of words. Our choice of words, our choice of language, shapes our thinking. And beyond that, it shapes how we emotionally respond to the stories we read. Which leads us to our principle number 16. Journalism provokes powerful emotional responses from the readers. Often, journalism is the only independent provider of information about conflicts, crisis and war, aside from rumors and propaganda. With limited options to verify news stories, 
Media reports greatly influence the way a conflict situation is perceived by the population. The reader's response is based on their understanding of the situation as well as their emotional reaction. It is the responsibility of journalists to provide a picture that is as accurate as possible and avoid unnecessarily steering anger and aggression by sensationalizing the news. Traditional reports tend to follow certain journalistic habits. The focus on sensational elements of the story, the fascination with the extreme blood and graphic violence. Although often perceived as catchy, such reporting triggers specific emotions in the reader, particularly anger, shock and resentment, and pity for the victims. By limiting and compressing the conflict parties into two, and then demonizing one party, these negative emotions turn public opinion further against the demonized party. Propaganda utilizes the reader's negative feelings to justify the use of force against this group to the extreme of engaging into war or violence. Conflict-sensitive reports concentrate on overcoming these habits and instead aim to implement the fundamental values of journalism, creating true understanding of the situation, its background and all actors, without limiting the reader's choices. Readers of conflict-sensitive news stories develop very different emotional responses. They develop empathy and gain a deeper understanding. Understanding creates compassion and often leads to a desire for changing unpleasant conditions to the benefit of all affected by the conflict. Negative or even aggressive emotional responses are often directly linked to the reporter focusing on blame as a central question in the report. But it is also a result of another scissor in the head, if you want so, an assumption we tend to make. It is the result of our desire to split the people we're dealing with, the stakeholders of conflict, into victims and perpetrators. When I run trainings with journalists, this is often a point where journalists feel the need to push back. They often argue that where there is conflict, where there is violence, there are victims. We can't possibly expect journalists not to name the perpetrators of violence, because wouldn't that be a shortcoming, a lack of accuracy or a lack of completeness and truth in our reports? Wouldn't it be unfair for the victims, undermining the delivery of justice? How to report on victims is a very sensitive question in conflict-sensitive journalism, and therefore here I would like to add some important considerations. When journalists report on victims, they usually focus on victims of violence. This means the emphasis of the article or story is on the direct violence. Victims are presented as passive recipients of this direct violence. They become interesting because of the cruelty they experience, which is described in a report, often in painful detail. The detailed and graphic descriptions of atrocities rarely contribute to greater understanding and are primarily driven by sensationalism, which caters to nothing but human voyeurism. In conflict, victims are not only affected by direct violence, they are victims of conflict. This includes victims of structural and cultural violence and the victims of misguided ideologies or their own blindfolds. Therefore, conflict-sensitive journalism urges reporters generally to avoid the term a victim since it disempowers those affected by violence and creates another two-party geometry between victims and perpetrators. In conflict, it is important to acknowledge that a perpetrator is also usually a victim and not seldom victims have been perpetrators before. You may have observed that the media now, in reports about domestic abuse, the Me Too movement, is not using the word victim. They talk about survivors. The term survivors has been coined by charities, by organizations and by survivors themselves because it empowers. It reminds the ones who have suffered that they are survivors, they are strong and they can do something about their life, about their future, about the injustice done to them. Survivor is a very different term to victim because victim leaves you in a corner, it leaves you passive, recipient of an injustice. Survivor means I have made it through this, I can do more, I can move on. Conflict-sensitive journalism is a way of presenting facts and information that resembles a delicate balancing act. Balance, the carefully weighted presentation of views, is a value anchored deeply in journalism and is part of every journalistic code of conduct. However, again, it is the interpretation of that ideal that distinguishes between high-quality reporting and pseudo-journalistic fodder for war propaganda.
So let's, as our last principle, principle 18, take a look what balance actually means. A dominant view is that balance in news reports is created by providing equal time to both sides, choosing equally elite sources, for example the spokesperson of two governments in conflict, both are given 5 minutes interview time and 15 seconds airtime in the final report. Sources are chosen based on the hierarchy of sources in which high-ranking officials and so-called authorities are preferred. The problem is that this creates quantitative balance. However, quantitative balance does not necessarily guarantee qualitative balance. So what is qualitative balance? To create true balance, relevant stakeholders have to have equal chance to explain their perspectives and needs. Balance is not created by same time, same position. It is based on the quality of the comments made. For example, if one source is a government spokesperson, but another group is represented by a doctor, this doesn't mean that there is no balance. Politicians are not automatically considered to be representatives of the people, as we discussed earlier. Unusual sources can complement the story with unusual perspectives. The choice of sources is dependent on who can truly contribute to our understanding of the report, who can truly represent the conflict parties, who can give us critical information to make sense of a very messy situation. Quantitative balance tends to veer into two-party geometry, one side versus the other side. When we look for qualitative balance, we automatically identify, discover, explore sources, angles, perspectives that are more varied, that are more detailed, that are more precise. We're not trapped in just simply creating weighing scales, weighing one versus the other. Think back to the round table geometry, identifying all the different actors around the table, giving all of them space, and some might need more space than others to express their views, and some need less. Creating qualitative balance means creating equal chances to be heard. So for an adequate representation of all actors, journalists have to balance their perspectives based on relevance for the content of the story and the actor's involvement, and not just based on quantitative measurements. So let's use this point now to draw a bit of a conclusion. Conflict-sensitive journalism is not easy. We had 18 tools we talked about, 18 instruments that help us to report conflict better. Implementing them is a challenge, and there's no doubt about that. However, there's no easy way out of our responsibility either. Reporting conflict is not just a job. It is a matter of life and death, after all. There's a lot more to explain and explore when it comes to applying these 18 principles of conflict-sensitive journalism to everyday reporting. The conflict reporting habits of the news media have become deeply embedded in newsroom attitudes and mindsets and are not easy to challenge and overcome. In addition, society has an often negative image of journalists as vultures who thrive on other people's tragedy and misery. Of course, journalism has its black sheep like any other profession. However, there are a number of things crucial to understand for everyone who chooses to engage and work with conflict and war journalists. Many journalists have seen more tragedy, violence and horror than nearly any other profession. They work along the cliff edge where civilized human behavior ends and something raw and brutal takes over, ripping apart the fabric of society. This experience makes many conflict journalists cynical, skeptical and dismissive. Journalists have, however, chosen this job for a reason. The chance to experience history, be part of something greater, give a voice to the voiceless, be a watchdog to power and build a society and community in which people can thrive. That is what drives many of us. Journalists, however cynical they seem, are idealists by heart. And conflict-sensitive journalism provides us with the tools and the ability to rediscover this idealism and revive the meaning of a profession that is vital to the survival of human rights and democracy. I am afraid in this episode I might have truly overloaded your mental circuit board. So let's take another break here. Maybe listen to this episode in several chunks and let all of it sink in. Compare what you hear with your own experiences. 
and you may come up with other observations that further enrich your understanding. Conflict-sensitive journalism is evolving with our understanding of conflict, of complexity, and of the role of journalists in society. And you are now part of this adventure. I hope you join me once more for our next and last episode of this conflict-sensitive journalism series. Until then, do some digesting, do some thinking, and always stay safe and stay sane. So much for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of the future episodes. And I would really appreciate if you leave me a rating on iTunes, on Spotify, Stitcher or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. If you want to learn more about the Peacebuilding Practitioner, head over to my webpage, that's www.thepeacebuildingpractitioner.org where you find plenty of articles from practitioners for practitioners. And if you want to dive even deeper into this field of work, join us for one of our online courses. If you want to learn more about that, just get in contact with me. You'll find the contact details in the show notes or on my webpage. Mm-hmm.